Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, esteemed panelists, for being on this interesting session on franchising. We're going to chat about some interesting nuances and dynamics around the space. So perhaps to begin with, uh, we could have uh, each of our panelists, uh, while they introduce themselves, I think uh, we, we have a very interesting mix of representations of brands here. Right? There's uh, Ravi who represents Wondershare wherein you need to interact with the brand and the category because it, it represents cooking and homeware, right? And uh, there's, of course, Sandeep, who is a very esteemed enabler, who brings in what you would call uh, evolving and enhancing the experience. And there's Rajat from Parista, who got in what you would say, experience to coffee, one of the first to bring it in. And there's a couple who represents VIP clothing, where there's athleisure and innerware, and uh, one of the first categories, which, and which is largely dominated by the large multi-brand outlet in India, right? So it would be interesting to hear from you, dear panelists, you know, is the debate of experience versus scale and expansion vis-a-vis -vis franchising still relevant? As, as a retail uh, industry, have we succeeded in embedding, uh, you know, brand experience, store experience, and customer engagement to the franchise network? So it would great, be great to have your thoughts and also these diverse segments that we are representing and talk about those dynamics. So, Kapil, we'd like to start with you. Hi. <clears throat> I think this, uh, the way we look forward overall when India entered into this franchising uh, business uh, late back in uh, 20th century, uh, and the time when the MNCs started coming to India, uh, why basically as a company, as a brand owner, we required uh, to scale up the uh, volumes and go into the franchising wars. Uh, basically, each and everyone wanted to be a part of their expertise in their own domain. And when it comes to their own domain, each and every category per se always venture into the franchising option. So let me just give you a thought on our perspective from uh, the innerwear and the clothing industry, uh, basically. Uh, the overall trade and the clothing industry uh, in India, when I talk about the pan-India, it actually, uh, you know, entered into this segment with uh, multi-brand outlets. So when I talk about the company per se, even for that matter, our dealers, our distributors, we call them as a franchisee uh, because they actually become the, their own uh, master of their own territory and they circulate the products to the individual single outlet stores that we called as a single franchisee. So probably the definition of uh, scaling the volume of the business here could be in terms of two different ways. One way is we look at the EBO structure that we talk about and the second way we look at a franchisee who runs the show and spread across to the multi-brand outlets. And that is how predominantly the more of uh, this textile industry and the innerwear and the athleisure industry actually work for. Sure, thanks. Rajat, your thoughts on, you know, you've, you've scaled at a phenomenal pace. I think you're the largest uh, coffee chain today in India. So ha has the balance of experience into that network and scale uh, been achieved? So I think uh, just to answer and give a perspective in terms of uh, uh, kind of giving a bit of perspective, not just coffee, but an overall FNB, uh, experience, experience is something which people come for, right? And that is something which is an essence of any FNB joint you go, uh, irrespective of the price points you prevail. Experience is something which matters a lot for the recurring uh, customer base to kind of engage with you. So irrespective whether it is a company owned strategy or a store network which or the brand which is growing through a franchise network, the essence is uh, the experience to the consumer has to be seamless. For him, he should not be able to differentiate between a franchisee network store versus a, a company owned network store and that is something which has been a epicenter for us as an organization to really cater to and to look at while we expand the network. If you were to look at uh, 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 to answer this question, I would kind of relate this subject to the, what is the most critical essence of successful franchise. So, I, so according to me, there are four P's which are very, very relevant. One is your product, 
which has to be something which has to stand out in the market for any kind of scalability or acceptance to happen. Pricing again, <laughs> what kind of price parity are you prevailing? Today there is a franchisee available at 5 lakh and there are franchisee opportunities at 5 CR. So there are a different set of investors which are available in each of the trajectory. So you have to be very, very mindful that what kind of uh, price parity you have to go in, in terms of positioning your product. The third, which I, which is very, very relevant is again, uh, is in terms of looking at the place. So again, uh, what I've seen in some of the uh, new age brands, there's a lot of urgency to franchise, right? So uh, according to me, one of the very, very important aspect while you get into the franchising is, is to kind of understand your backend infrastructure, whether you can really support those expectations. Looking at a company owned funnel versus a franchisee owned funnel in a different lens is not something which will yield, to long, uh, which will yield long term benefits. And that is something which is a very, very important aspect while you look at scaling of the franchise network. So backend infrastructure, how strong you are, what cities you can, because there's a very, very easy entry way to look at scaling. But the essence is whether you can scale up, scale up and really grow the network on a year on year basis and that is something which is very important. And our fourth is that the right partner selection. So the fourth P which is very, very critical in terms of the overall journey for any brand which is looking at franchising is the partner selection criteria, the processes, the way we orient the franchisee partner, there have to be very, very robust processes to look at creating that funnel. So I think if these four P's are, we are able to answer those firmly, then th that's the only time we should look at actually creating a network and to scale the network to the franchisee orientation. Otherwise, uh, uh, there are large chances that the network which you create will not be sustainable. And for any brand to have, have a sustainable network, these things need to be ticked off. Thank you, Raja. That was really interesting to say that, you know, you have to assess your capabilities to be able to uh, put out a franchising template there. Sandeep, you would like to come in from an uh, enabler perspective. You know, you talked of there's in-store, there's pre-store and post-store. You, you focus on the pre-store and the post-store. You want to talk to us a little about sure. that? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> So, yeah, so I'll just take it up uh, from where Rajat uh, you know, started and uh, you know, kind of drilled into it. That you know, while it's important to build or embed the brand experience when it comes to uh, scaling up the franchisee, but you know, today if you look at the uh, you know the the landscape, 75 to 80 percent of the consumers who are online haven't you know shopped online, right? But their discoverability has become online, right? So uh, while there's a you know, there's an importance and the brand lays a lot of emphasis on building in-store experience in line with the brand. But a lot of times, you know, when we work with customers and, you know, we run a product platform which enables brands to digitize their stores, physical stores presence online, right? So, but today the customer's experience of uh, encountering a brand starts online, right? So while these customers are not shopping online, but the discoverability is online. So they'll go to you know search engines and they'll you know type for the best coffee shop near me or best coffee shop which is open right now, and if the experience is broken there, right, the customer doesn't care whether it's a franchisee or uh, a company-owned stores as Rajat mentioned, right. So for the consumer, it's the uh, the brand which is being represented, either physically or digitally. So these are the pre-store experiences, uh, you know, which irrespective whether it's a franchisee or it's a company-owned store, uh, which as a brand you need to uh, take care of and when it comes to post store experiences when a customer comes and leaves a review can you educate more customers to leave reviews for either the company owned stores or the franchisee owned stores and the ability to re-engage with these customers uh, who've come to your stores I you know I related to uh, the uh, you know it being the cookie for the offline world right so when a customer visits your store there's very less analytics around who that customer was what did he shop for? Probably you'll know what that he, he shop for, but can you link it back to what was his search query? What what led him to your store in the first place? So building those experiences, I think uh, from a franchisee or a company standpoint, it's important while you scale up your operations, it's very important to scale up the customer experience holistically rather than just looking at the in-store uh, experience of uh, you know the customer because today the, the journey is pretty much an omni-channel journey for the customer. Thank you, Sandeep. Ravi, given your category is so involved with, you know, engaging and interacting with the category and the product to, to know the benefits, what, have, what do you believe? While there is expansion, have you been able to bring that experience as the brand grew from 
being uh, perhaps in uh, multi-branded outlets to exclusive stores? Yeah, Paki, I think uh, your question is extremely relevant. Experience versus skilling. Uh, as well as specifically to our category, which requires a lot of demonstrations. It's a complex category. In Wondershop, we do complex things. That's what differentiates us. Uh, things which are not sold, uh, equipment which are not sold um, by other brands. And it's very important to create believability there. And absolutely, yes, our exclusive brand outlets play a huge role in that. They are experience centers, but we sell from them as well. The question is, why do we want this complexity in the very first place? Why look at franchising at all? And I think that is the basic question. Uh, ideally, we would love to have all Coco outlets, company owned, company operated, because you have total control. Why do we look at franchising? And why, why create this mess in our mind? Uh, I think there are two or three reasons. One is, as we say in retail, location, location, location. And sometimes you want to be in that location, you want to be in a Karol Bagh, or you want to be in a Dadar, or you want to be on Lincoln Road. And uh, there's an excellent, excellent location, but the guy is simply not willing to rent it out to you because his life is operating that business, that shop, and you just get to him with a better proposition, and uh, you want that location, and you get that location. So a lot of our franchise outlets are because of this reason. Um, second, what we have also observed with experience is that the local contacts, the local context is brought about by the franchisee. India is so diverse. Sure. Uh, that, you know, we depend on our partners to somehow crack the local markets. And third, again, through experience, it has been borne out that while intuitively we may think that, you know, our own managers under full control, under full um, uh, processes, they might deliver better. At times, our franchise outlets deliver better because they are entrepreneurs. And that, that passion of an entrepreneur, you simply can't bring in a manager. I mean, all of us have been managers in our lives, but, you know, when you put your own uh, life at risk, when you put your own money on the table, I think the dedication, the uh, amount of passion is something else. And I think that really helps us. So frankly, we are in our journey, uh, wearing more towards the franchising model than the Coco model. So interesting. It's interesting that in this very first pointer that we've chatted, we've come out with such interesting supply and demand dynamics. You know, Rajat put across the supply uh, deep dive that one should do and how Ravi's put that perspective to say that, you know, the, that person is an entrepreneur and he's striving to grow the business and his, uh, you know, um, the passion he has to make it scale. And um, let's come back to you, uh, couple, to understand uh, what is your brand or your company does did as you know initiatives to develop engage that franchise network that you've developed and something about you know the cost and the benefit analysis of that would be interesting to know. So for us, uh, South Zone has been always a dominated market for us, and hence uh, going around company strategy was to open up a the first franchisee EBO outlet in the South Zone. We started with opening up the outlet in uh, Kerala as such. But uh, before opening up any of the uh, franchisee outlets, uh, I think from a company's perspective, it is very important that we analyze uh, the, uh, you know, the, the backing of the franchisee. The most important element as a good practice is uh, not to think about the franchisee as a typically as a franchisee itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you think about the franchisee as, as, your, as your business partner or as your associate partner, I think the perspective from a company side completely changes across. Uh, uh, some of the practices that we followed in our company during the process was uh, to the extent of, you know, uh, analyzing who the franchisee is, uh, what about his uh, background, whether he has his own expertise in the same field or he is coming from a different field and taking the franchisee of yours. That's also very important because many a times it happens that uh, he, he wants a franchisee of a a garment uh, outlet as a EBO to start with, but he comes from a different perspective. Now over here, uh, a lot of synergies can go for a change, but it's not that the franchisee would be unable to do that, but it is very important from a franchisor to look at the perspective from where he comes from. And uh, second thing is as, uh, Ravi rightly mentioned that uh, location is the key element. I mean, uh, uh, whether it's an opening of a textile outlet or whether it's an opening of an FNB service, location is going to be the key element of getting the uh, drive force into your outlet. 
and not just from a sales perspective but from a visibility point of view also so it's very very relevant and important that one needs to understand uh, all these best, best practices to follow and uh, to take the franchisee in confidence with you secondly uh, while running the various franchisee agreements it is very important that uh, the company follows each and every uh, you know points along with the franchisee or with the company official associates to understand what kind of agreements that one company is going to get uh, deep, uh, deep dive with the franchisee in terms of whether there is any restrictions of the product being sold in the particular area or he is going to cater to the franchisee from a holistic point of view sure. so there are i mean if you if you go there are so many yeah, such it's best a very practices detailed template that here. we can go along i thought sure. i thought to name some few but yes i think one important element is the location where the franchisor should not at all compromise by any means of it thank you kapil rajat uh, your industry has been uh, you know marked by uh, international incumbents literally setting such strong practices in uh, in franchising we, you know we know that with with a large number of uh, mcdonalds and dominos uh, what have you your what is your brand what is your company done differently what have, what have you taken a leaf from their those templates it will help understand a little on those lines sure so basically just to uh, kind of add on to what my colleague has said uh, a very very important aspect which we all know is uh, product and the location right which is which is i think one of the base case to kind of build any business and uh, even on the franchise side that's very very relevant few of the initiatives which as i said uh, earlier as well which are very very important to us in terms of our uh, journey is our partner selection criteria and also what we have done uh, in terms of uh, right over the last 6 7 years of active franchising is in terms of looking at our infrastructure capabilities when i say infrastructure capability is not only about looking at the product and uh, sourcing and their cost economy it is also about a 360 degree perspective to actually make the market whether that market opportunity is there to really sell that product or not do those market sizing do those studies before we were to go into those markets and also to look at creating opportunities uh, from a market marketing tactical perspective to generate growth because most of the partners i am sure uh, my fellow colleagues would agree are are uh, first timers into some of the businesses which they are looking at franchising so they have no backlog of what what a franchising opportunity is what a fnb is what textile is or some of the other opportunities which are available and for most it is the second line of business they would have passion they would have money to spend but yes to really get them into the dna to really understand the product well and how how a certain category behaves is a is a, is a time consuming process and that is something which we have been able to do right so for example now we have kind of recently done a, a detailed enrolled we have launched a learning management module where the partners also have to spend a certain level of time on a on a on a monthly basis to really grow through those modules those modules are not only centric to the employee employees at the store but also at a partner promoter level to really be understanding what the model is so that at least their the and the understanding and the way they are interacting with their employees is very very seamless so i think some of these touch points are very very important if you were to build a network which is scalable and network which can be sustained scalability is easy in franchising i think sustainability is something which is very very critical and i think for all the fellow uh, people attending here it's very very relevant to understand whether our homework and infrastructure has been done in the right way to really support the infrastructure because the surge will happen fairly quickly you have to really maintain that surge interesting you have to <coughs> cautiously watch and monitor the expansion <coughs> sandeep what have you ever been told by your uh, you know the clients that uh, you know the template we roll out for a franchise store should be different from what we roll out from a brand owned stores have you come across these conversations and these conflicts and how do they what is the lens that they look at when they're looking at conversing with an enabler or a stakeholder who's coming in to enhance the experience it'd be interesting to hear your nuggets on that sure uh, great question so <laughs> uh we see a, a spectrum of uh, you know customers right so there would be customers who and you know automobile is a very large segment for us uh, and so is uh, fnb right so in automobile i'll take an example of again distribution of their dealerships which are nothing but franchisees right uh, uh, they are all uh, you know dealerships who run these company owned company operated stores 
so there you know while the brand controls a lot of communication brand wants to control a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, offers price point but there would be certain large dealerships yeah. which have the clout uh, who would want to control marketing spend themselves right uh, and then there'll be a long tail of dealerships who are not very digital savvy so they would rely on us to build their digital presence us to you know do their marketing spend so that's where you know the conversation of a something called a co-opt marketing spend comes in where the brand says okay you put x i'll put x uh, to get the customer in right now you know as ravi said these are all uh, you know entrepreneurs who are running franchises right so they want tools to spend money on marketing but brands obviously want to control the 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 communication they want to control the the brand you know uh, uh, messaging so give them tools to enable them to uh, spend money and then on the other hand uh, you know from a templatization standpoint uh, you know brands are opening up uh, you know so they through our you know platform we kind of built a tool where uh, the brand can really configure that okay what rights they want to give to each of their franchisee partners maybe the brand says that okay i would not give you the right to respond to reviews uh, which are coming on different platforms but i would give you the right to uh, analyze or see the ratings of your store uh, see the rating of competitor stores which are nearby uh, see the ratings of uh, your store compared to the company's other store uh, kind of gamify it right so i think from a template standpoint what we've been seeing uh, which is happening over the period of time so it is moving from centralized management in terms of marketing and you know uh, uh, commerce capabilities uh, now it is moving to a decentralized but still a very very controlled environment where the brands want to retain the control of what offers what uh, communication what messaging but still give franchisees the ownership of spending money on marketing right i mean they have to move on from you know spending money of by you know sending leaflets to apartment complexes right so they have to move on to start spending that money efficiently which is mostly happening on digital these days so we you know power or empower these franchisees in the template which the brand gives us just the right word empower and we seeing a very interesting segmentation of even the franchise network emerging sandeep from what we hear you say and it's very interesting how you you're not only enabling the consumer analysis but you're even helping you know bring about dynamics of performance monitoring and you know pro- uh, enhancing the entrepreneurship spirit there ravi your thoughts on what is your brand done to develop engage and also the cost benefit analysis like as we rajat was and kapil were chatting about uh okay i'll give a slightly different viewpoint sure, sure. uh you know as a brand it is all nice to say i want to tick every box i want a great location i want a great rental i want the perfect guy who is motivated the right age he has domain expertise and everything you don't get it unfortunately exactly. Exactly. otherwise we'll all be mcdonalds yeah. <laughs> uh so i do what i have always done in life don't stick to the domain okay i have myself built 14 different businesses none of them a similar domain business and i believe that people can take up the challenge location is most important the right rental is important and then uh, when the franchisee is there what we do is we continuously develop a common pool of talent uh, as uh, store managers okay so in many cases the franchisee herself or himself wants to be the store manager in many cases uh, they don't want to be we have this pool where we uh, give them trained store managers we also give them trained manpower below the uh, manager and i think that takes care of a great deal because our equipment is highly involving mm-hmm. to train new people into that to expect people to invest in that training is more difficult so at any point in time we have 50 60 people getting trained in our various products we have more than 400 appliances it's difficult to understand everything and a customer can put their finger on anything and say mujhe dikha do and if you can't show it then you know the whole experience is lost so we give this man power and i think that has been a great leveler we can bet on location and then beyond that we just support the franchisee besides that there are the obvious things so whatever may be the location it will be our architect who will go there and design it and you know create some nuances which are uh, uh, gelling with the mall or the high street location uh, we will do the visual merchandising we will tell them what inventory to keep we will put our pos the the works but we support with our own people and i think that is the key 
Interesting. <clears throat> so in fact, uh, taking this forward, we've been talking about various elements that each and point is that each of the segments that are represented on this panel have been adopting. Um, let's talk a little about, let's move on and talk a little about the evolution of franchising that India has seen over time, you know, given the challenges, given the diversity, geographical, regional, where are we vis-a-vis -vis the maturity of other retail economies, mature economies? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? You know, have we kind of, um, what are the avatars and the models that we believe will come into play and shape this space? What has been the evolution and what do we believe it will be, given yeah. India's uh, landscape? So when we, when we talk <clears throat> about the uh, overall retail perspective uh, structure in India, uh, today also we say that 2% of the organized segment of the re overall retail uh, dominates the overall uh, India as a uh, avatar in terms of moving forward from, a, from a organized retailing. And uh, as we said that uh, more and more multinational companies when they started to come in yeah. uh, to India uh, through the form of the various franchisee outlets, the international brands that came to India by means of uh, various tie-ups with the franchisee outlets, uh, I think the Indian brand owners started looking at this model uh, to a very larger uh, spectrum and they believed that uh, to diversify and to penetrate into this 140 uh, crores of population of uh, India which uh, we talk about that every state dominates and calls for each country per se. Uh, so much of, so much of uh, abundance of opportunity for us to be a part of this and hence uh, India diversified into and classified into each state and every brand owner thought that there is a potential that we need to go uh, to each and every state and open up the brand uh, franchisee uh, by localizing also at various level. I mean, if you go to a south region, the culture, you will have to just uh, adopt the culture of the, the, the tradition of the south per se the culture of the north. And uh, uh, that is how overall the franchisee concept actually got into the structure and hence today, I think uh, we all should be proud that uh, our Indian brands, the Indian brand who, which has constituted and entered into the pan-India and not just in India. I mean, we are, we are now seeing the, uh, the Indian brand on a global platform uh, today in the franchising model and that's how uh, I would say that, uh, yes, I mean, uh, the evolution started by looking at the international uh, uh, brands coming to India, but now the transformation is happening from the Indian brands going on a sure. global platform. Rajat, your thoughts on, you know, what, what has been the uh, journey and what avatars are coming about given India's landscape? See, there have been definitely a lot of learnings which come from the international brands because for any... Uh, 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 Probably to put a structure together, you would always go for learnings and some of these matured brands who've been operating for a certain level of years, there is always a lot of learning to really uh, kind of go through and then enact in your model. The way I see most of, uh, uh, so as I said in my uh, earlier conversation as well, so in India the franchising is very scattered, it starts from a, a lakh rupee model to about uh, a 10 CR model as well. So it's a very, very scattered model and there are various set of investors uh, who are ready to kind of bank into the various opportunities available in the market. One thing if I were to kind of touch upon from an FNB perspective, one thing which I see as and when the market matures and uh, the way we see the journey, there would be larger structures available like for example some of the international brands have come through uh, not a lot of multi-unit partners, but maybe a state-level uh, partner model or maybe model which is a country-specific model if I were to look at larger brands. In India still, that culture is very, very discreet. It's more uh, single-oriented uh, partners which are available for, uh, for franchise. So I think as uh, the India landscape moved towards a more organized FNB, one thing which is, which is for sure that you'll have large set of investors will be available for a large set of kitty and looking at managing a macro market than looking at a smaller market being managed. Uh, another which thing which I see is there would be l large control in terms of company also as uh, Ravi also said that there is a model to look at 
uh, getting the store operated through our, our uh, store guy who is being managed by us or maybe on payrolls. So a FICO model, which is a franchisee invested company operated model is also something which I see too, because FNB again, see FNB, everybody has a view, any partner, when you say 400 partners or uh, a certain level of partners whom you're working, you're actually working with 400 entrepreneurs and everybody has a view on business, right? Everybody knows how to make coffee, everybody knows how to make sandwich, right? So one thing which is very, very important is that you have to kind of brand, you, uh, you have to put your brand SOPs first rather than creating a discrete mechanism to manage business. So I see uh, the way the, the, the macroeconomics is maturing, the FICO is one model which will mature well and also there would be large set of partners who will come to take the large uh, share of the kitty and I think that is where the model will sustain in future, especially on the FNB side. Very interesting thoughts there, Raja. Thank you for that. Sandeep, your thoughts on, given that you work across a spectrum of, you know, segments, auto, FNB, uh, consumer uh, apparel. So, w what are your thoughts on how is this? So, uh, you know, in RV, since we work with so many different categories and work with them so closely, very, very disruptive models we are yes. seeing. I know whether you want to call it franchisee or not, uh, but, you know, in the services space, uh, we work with a lot of uh, brands who have, uh, you know, their agent network, right? Yes. You know, all of this agent network is nothing but entrepreneurs who are selling, have been selling policies, right? So brands are not digitizing them and uh, giving them tools to market themselves. So you can call them, you know, virtual agents, right? Uh, so that's mostly happening in the services space. In the product space, again, very, very early days, but there are discussions which are happening specifically in the automobile space to open virtual dealerships, right? So when I say virtual dealerships, typically a dealership will uh, take a large amount of space. You will have, uh, you know, cars which are displayed. It's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a big investment. So, you know, brands are evaluating and specifically brands who are more experience-led brands, uh, luxury experience-led brands, they're saying that why not, you know, build these virtual dealerships at places where, you know, people don't have access uh, to dealerships. And, you know, anyways, it's going to be a test drive, right, which can go to the people's doorstep. So that's another model of, uh, you know, I mean, again, I don't know whether to call it franchising or not, but so, again, a virtual dealership, uh, which is coming through uh, without a location or very, very small uh, location. Uh, similarly, in the uh, F&B space, right, uh, we've been uh, sort of seeing a lot of brands doing franchising for cloud kitchens, right? I'm sure uh, Rajat would uh, would have seen that happening, right? Uh, because, you know, you again can't open a restaurant in every place. Uh, these cloud kitchens are dark kitchens. You essentially have uh, your brand being run by somebody else, but they are not running a physical store. They are essentially using that uh, location or using that kitchen to service the uh, the the aggregators. Uh, so yeah, so these three interesting models are coming through. Uh, how successful they become, uh, only time will tell. But it's a very very disruptive model in my view because it takes away the constraint of the space, uh, takes away the constraint of uh, you know maybe your trained staff. Uh, the, the guy who's running it has to be trained for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a model which you know is kind of trying to create efficiencies. Uh, through using digital very, very effectively. So, Thank so you, Sandeep. I mean, we've already talked of various models and, you know, overcoming the conflict of investment, look space, location. Uh, Ravi, your thoughts on what, what uh, you know, you of course started, you, you were one of the first to describe few new models, but any more you'd like to add to what Rajat's... Uh, yeah. oh, no, Paki, your, your question was very interesting and I would like to go back to the original question, which was about the journey of franchising in India. Correct. And I just want to give a little perspective on that, that there are a lot of young people here, so they may not remember. But uh, franchising really started in India when, when malls came about, you know, when organized retail came about. That is when we heard of franchising. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I somehow at that point in time was in a job where, you know, my job was to get exciting franchises to India and uh, build restaurants and coffee chains and hotels and whatnot. And thanks to that, I met a whole lot of amazing brands all over the world. And you will be shocked to know, all of you, that uh, most of these franchise rights for Indian territory were already given out. Mm -hmm. Now, how was that? You know, when there was no franchising in India, who took India's rights? It was NRIs living in Hong Kong, Singapore and Dubai. True. Because in these markets, retail developed first. Yeah. Franchising developed first. So let's take India. Ko bhi le lete India is a small se jungle. Hai. Take India rights also. You cannot believe biggest of brands had signed off their rights in perpetuity for the Indian market to these NRIs 
and who were very smart taking those rights, but they didn't do any damn thing with the Indian market because there was no organized space. And then each brand had this difficult journey to pull themselves out from the clutches of these people and uh, you know they had to pay them and and this is a, this is a red flag i want to raise here because here we are sitting on the brand side wanting to franchise and when we talk about master franchising and regional franchising we have to be very careful at times we can write away our rights and then have to pay hefty sums of money to take it back no very interesting and that. the wheel has come full circle pakhi i know we are stressed for time but i'll just tell you and then there was this little micro franchising uh, you know outlet by outlet and you know what is happening retail is getting consolidated again i will not name the names because they are big people but we know who is consolidating all the retail and today these kind of two or three large companies are again becoming master licensees or master franchisees for most of the international brands for india and even acquiring indian brands who are aspiring to expand because they can put them in all their outlets and take them big happens or not is another story but the rights are written off so that is that is how the journey is so that's a that's a very important call out and you're truly right that's how it happened we, we have experiences of brands paying out hefty money taking back their royalties and franchise in fact so we'll take that point forward and we'll now talk about the facet of multi channel conflict you know back there in the in the speaker room we all were chatting about uh, uh, you know the brick and mortar challenge the um, uh, the omni Uh, commerce challenge the marketplaces brand dot com are we uh, what are you know are we succeeding uh, are we addressing this uh, across manpower training technology performance monitor and are we engaging this prime stakeholder the franchiser the french you know this this franchisee as retailers growing as categories is, are growing uh, what are your you know the on your thoughts on this facet and then your concluding points i mean because this is a very important uh, metric as cha- as channels are growing is that mul- in that is the franchise each stakeholder being catered to it'd be interesting to understand that see first of all for every franchisee whether he comes from uh, any category uh, he or she i mean uh, the franchisee has to undergo a series of sops that one brand owners will have to be defined and when we talk about uh, whether it's a franchisee for an uh, exclusive outlet or per se for a multi brand outlets where we cater to we have around uh, 36000 multi brand outlets pan india which we are catering to we cater through uh, our distributor so we call it as a master franchisee who have the rights to distribute the products to their to their single franchisee uh, which is about the retailers the very important element of the fact is that you have put forward is are we catering to the right uh, training mechanism so whether it's a exclusive outlets or whether it's a multi brand outlets uh, for every franchising whether it's a master franchise or whether it's a micro level franchise i think training of franchising the franchise owner that's very important training of a franchisee owner is going to be a, a very very crucial element and along with the training of the franchisee owner even the uh, the works the workforce that is going to be involved in the process is also required to be trained accordingly many a times it happens that uh, the franchisee owner uh, whoever takes the brand franchise outlet wants to rigorously actually start the business process without undergoing the training and it is very important that each and every fundamentals of training is completed not just the training of the business but the training of the back end process where technology is also involved these days i mean we talk about the technology of ai now coming in place but during the earlier period today we we have the technology where the franchisee softwares the pos the pos systems each and every training is very very crucial for uh, for the franchisee to scale up the business overall thanks ka Rajat, uh, you know, with this this whole multi-channel play, this conflict, and w- what are we doing to, you know, optimize it and resolve it? I think it's a very interesting question and uh, something which we have off lately focused. Just to give you a live example, like for example, there are about forty stores which we operate in Delhi NCR. Just an example, and uh, out of that, twenty can actually cater to the entire online universe, right? So what we do over the other twenty, which we also have the right to really go online. 
and that is something as brands also we not prepared about five years back while we were signing up the contracts and I can't really go today and really negotiate on the contract which we have signed. So again, this is something which is again a, a school of thought for a lot many people who are looking into active franchising from the brand side to really look into some of these niches while they are docu doing their documentation to get those right because some of these conflicts as, as Ravi said that the conflicts to get resolved is much more a tedious task not only from a bandwidth perspective but also from a cost perspective it's a big big uh, uh, issue to be really managed so again this is a small example where we have conflicts now to really onboard partners on online because the same radius is also getting catered as soon as you onboard the same business is getting distributed to 40, right? So, so this is something which, as a brand, we were not able to kind of envisage seven, eight years back. And now that business has become so big post-COVID, uh, to be honest, that is something which becomes very, very difficult to manage. So I think more and more, uh, why, the way we are looking at uh, visualizing the franchisee contracts and growth going forward, very, very important imperative for all of us to understand the macroeconomics five years hence, and then you do your sign-ups and documentation so that everybody has skin in the game and we are able to at least remove conflict. And one thing which is very, very important to grow the network is to not have a conflicted view on the network because end of the day, everybody is there for that share of business and we really conflict, we can't conflict that business. Thank you. Thank you, Rajat. Uh, Sandeep, from the omni-channel perspective, you know, how do you see this playing out? Like we said, the share is growing, the channels are growing and, you know, everyone is worried about their margin in that play. So from an omni-channel, what do you believe? How do you enable uh, the stakeholders across that? So I, I'll go back to the first principle, right? I mean, if you look at the, the core of uh, this business, right? It is about the, the brand love, uh, the product. Sure. So you need to have a brand and a product which consumers love. You need to have a <clears throat> brand and a product which consumers would buy once and they would want to buy again. Channels, in my view, don't... I mean, there's no conflict in the channel. Obviously, there is conflict in how you manage those channels. Uh, if you manage it effectively, you have the models in place. It's about the business model. You may want to operate a certain business model uh, in the franchisee network. Uh, there's another business model which you have to maintain, uh, build for, uh, you know, EBOs. Uh, nobody knew, heard about quick commerce about two years back, right? So quick commerce came in, so that's a new channel altogether, right? So channels will keep coming. Uh, you know, I feel the metrics or the model on which you operate and, you know, you have to eventually make every channel profitable on its own, right? Uh, so I see if you're, you know, have an EBO, the rental you pay is, you know, essentially a marketing cost to be at that great location, right? You open a brand.com, you will have to spend dollars on Facebook and Meta and Google to bring that traffic, right? Uh, the same channel margin you give away to, uh, say, Amazon or a Flipkart or a Mintra, right? So now in your business model, you have to make sure that you cater for that because each channel will come up with its own nuances, with its own, uh, you know, uh, challenges. But at the end of the day, it is about the consumer. Uh, as a brand, you need to make sure that you need to be present when the consumer uh, is accessing you and you need to make sure that the brand reaches the consumer at the place of his convenience and his choice. Uh, I mean, if you just make it as simple as this, right? So there's a brand, there's a product and there's a consumer and keep consumer at the center, that consumer wants to access my brand uh, at the time and place of his convenience, I need to be there so that I don't miss out that opportunity of that consumer connect. I think then rest is manageable, right? I mean, rest is all manageable. Ravi, given your brand has gone through this entire journey of being first available in a, you know, a, a hypermarket, then being available in specialized home uh, retail and then moving on to EBO, then Coco for, for how have, and then now you were telling us that quick commerce, I mean, your, your blenders are ordered uh, on, on quick commerce these days, you have online. How have you, you know, dabbled with that space of evolving and then the emerging channels and the various channels you're catering to? Yeah, look, uh, we've spoken a lot about conflict, but nobody has addressed that elephant in the room, which is pricing. <laughs> because that is the biggest challenge. Now, it's also specific to the category I was thinking sitting here, that when people go to have Rajat's coffee, you know, they'll happily pay 400 rupees if they are having a coffee in uh, the same brand of coffee in an Inox outlet, yeah. and 1,000 rupees when they're having uh, it in a five-star location, and uh, 75 rupees in some other place, or uh, even 50 rupees in a cafeteria. Sure. 
but uh, if my blender is one rupee here or there on amazon versus a franchise outlet versus a multi brand store all hell will break loose and you know social media will be a buzz that wonder chef is cheating people so i think it really depends on the category but uh, there are ways to manage the conflict one has to do honest pricing and be honest to the consumer and uh, we always believe in win win uh, yes quick commerce is disturbing people a lot as a brand our ambition is to grow as big as we can to be the leaders and so we will be there as a brand on every single channel and that is a stated policy uh, we will not carve out things and protect people's rights we are honest with them as per the agreements but then as market evolves into online quick commerce whatever uh, we will do that and uh, today my quick commerce turnover is more than the turnover of our entire uh, ebo stores wow. you know which is wow. which is something but the the policy is win win so here's a proposal uh we should be selling our coffee machines from barista outlets and we should be marketing barista beans on our website so you know that's how you yeah. solve the conflict yeah no no this is interesting you know we've been we should like ravi clearly concluded saying we can't use the word conflict with channel anymore if it's cute q commerce channel is as big as an ebo store so uh, i thank you panelists some amazing uh, insights here and learnings across you know what a brand should be uh, taken to cognizance while expanding how should experience get embedded into the network what what should you you know how you need to draw up sops your training uh, the monitoring uh, very very interesting uh, insights and models that we chatted about would the uh, audience like to you know ask questions to the panel on uh, given their experience sure hi hi everyone this is ashish so hi thanks for the insightful information so my question is for uh, sorry just uh, my question to kapil so kapil i want to ask you about the basically i have attended a few sessions before as well related to data and all so i wanted to understand the importance of centralized system extended to the franchises model because you know uh, it's a cost to the company right brand extending your centralized system to their billing system to their post systems but uh, i just wanted you to highlight the importance of extended your own system in the prospect of data and in prospect of data driven decisions on maybe expanding the franchise model or maybe uh, taking decisions so please highlight on that thank you it's a nice question because we are in the world of data analysis completely and driven by uh, all the data perspective so from our uh, perspective from my company side of you so we started with a very Uh, everyone started in this world with a traditional way of working and then we transformed into a data system uh, with the uh, you know uh, upcoming uh, venture of uh, sap coming in the system where we try to acknowledge each and every processes uh, right from the procurement to the uh, process to uh, the collection cycle to the inventory management as well uh going back to the franchisee also because as i said that we we operate in a multi brand outlets and we have our own master franchisee in terms of the distribution dealers uh we uh, also started uh, recently couple of years back with the distribution management system so called dms which actually acknowledges the uh master franchisee's complete inventory model and because we have a sales force of 150 people pan india within the company which goes to the multi brand outlets which captures the data uh, we we give each and every sales force a tab which actually punches the data from the multi brand outlet that particular tab is synchronized to our master franchises back end system which is a distributor management system and the sap is now synchronized to distributor management system so the cycle is very clear that whatever order that goes from the uh, retail i mean to the retailer is actually captured now not just to the macro level of franchisee but also to the back end of uh, company's uh, sap system the overall uh, gallops of this completely data driven structure is right procurement of material to the right inventory management system which is very important for cost reduction in the overall process so exactly resonating I, what I'm, rajat I'm had sure said I'm, that you have to have the back end completely detailed out and also just to add to what uh, kapil said that is very important to understand that if somebody is taking the franchise he just don't want to put a brand right 
He is taking a complete collated portfolio. It's a collaborated portfolio you're giving. And point of sale, a sector is all part of the journey. So that is an integrated solution is looking at. Otherwise, he would be more than happy to set his own thing, right? So that's where the differentiation is that you're giving a portfolio. You're not looking at something which is segmented out of that portfolio. And then he is willing to invest for the entire portfolio. Any other questions for our uh, insightful uh, panel? Yeah, I have two questions. One is the for the franchisee store, franchisee store owner, like we discussed now. So there are multiple channels of retail now. Like there is a franchisee store and then there is online. There are like Amazon and Flipkart. And then you use your brand.com websites. So again, two problems arise here. One is a discount. So discount maybe I think is a difficult problem to address because it uh, depends on the buying power. So if we leave the discount aside, then comes the problem of the stocking, right? So uh, some consumer walks into the franchisee store, is not happy with the stock available because uh, 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 vanilla store is around six, uh, 600 to 1500 square feet. Okay, can I take the question? I understand what you're asking. Yes. So uh, good question. Uh, first of all, pricing. You said it's fait accompli. You cannot help it. No, you have to help it. You have to control it as a brand, otherwise you will die. Okay, yeah. you will have too many problems. So, uh, brands, if they want to survive, they have to control the pricing. It has to be same for the same product across channels regardless. Regardless of the buying power. Uh, and it is more true for online because discoverability is so much easier. So, you have to be able to control the online pricing. And there are ways to do it. You have to have that power with the interlocutors, with the platforms that you can control your pricing there, right? Or you take necessary steps to take down your listing in case they continue to discount your product. Uh, at times, some large retailers can discount a little bit. So let's say uh, you may have a store in uh, Gurgaon, uh, in NCR, and somebody in Chennai is, uh, let's say, large chain like Giriyas is discounting because they are a large purchaser. It doesn't affect really your sale. So that can happen, and that is where uh, pricing power gets leveraged, buying power gets leveraged. But even that, as a brand, we try to control, and one must try to control. Uh, so it's very important, right? Same price parity. The second question you asked is availability. Yes, uh, availability for sure. I mean, uh, which is why uh, brands like large outlets. So if that is a franchise store, we will always insist to the franchisee to invest enough in inventory, right? And of course, then that is uh, regulated as per the needs of that catchment, which may be slightly more specific than some other catchment. But by and large, things should be available. Slightly more difficult in fashion, because you know it's a matter of a lot of colors and designs and everything, and which is where seamless buying or endless aisle, those kind of concepts also work, that you can book the order here, and it will be supplied to you from the uh, brand warehouse, but you get the money, you get the margins. So there are ways to attack these problems. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, panelists. That was a very, very insightful uh, learning and dialogues and conversations we had around franchising. Thank you once again for taking time out. And